Welcome, everyone. And we are now at episode 30. Hello, Father. Hello, Christine. Good day. Good day to you. Good day to everyone. Yeah. And how are you? I am well. Yes. Thank God. Not too bad. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Good. OK, well, we've got a marathon day of recording today, haven't we, Father? So we'll we'll start off straight away with prayer. We're probably going to need it <laughs> more than ever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you and we bless you. We thank you for the gift of this teaching given to us by St. John Paul II, we thank you for the gift of this opportunity to share this life-giving and culture-transforming message to our listeners, to the Theology of the Body community. We ask for open minds and generous hearts, a true receptivity after the example of Mary, um, whose powerful intercession we pray for today and also saint joseph our beloved patron and saint john paul himself we make this prayer through christ our lord amen father and son holy spirit amen amen so episode 30 we are nearly at the end of john paul ii's analysis of historical man so we are making significant progress so episode 30 and we're looking at general audiences 54 and 55, for those who are following along with us with the text. So this audience opens pretty much where the previous one closed as we continue this analysis of St. Paul, and in particular, the notion of purity that he writes about, and the fact that purity stretches far beyond mere carnal or physical um, purity, but that for St. Paul, Purity is at the heart of every moral good in, in all its dimensions. It's linked with life according to the spirit, is how he says it, with every action coming under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So we're continuing with this analysis of purity. And last week we examined Paul's letter to the Galatians. And this time we're looking at St. Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. And John Paul II directs us in particular to this part of the letter to the Thessalonians, and I'll just read it out. He says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from unchastity, that each one of you knows how to keep his own body with holiness and reverence, not as the object of lustful passions like the Gentiles who do not know God. And then it continues, For God did not call us to impurity, but to sanctification. Therefore, whoever rejects these norms rejects not a human being, but God, who gives us his Holy Spirit. So John Paul II goes on to examine the use of the word purity, and he does so in two ways. The first way, he says, purity can be seen in some sense as an attitude or as a virtue. Um, because when it is exercised properly, it's done by a person who has reached a stage of maturity. Someone who knows, as St. Paul says, how to keep his own body with holiness and reverence and not as the object of lustful passions. So John Paul II says someone who has attained the practical ability that enables them to act well this attitude of purity, this exercise of the virtue of purity has therefore taken root in their will. So purity then is a, an attribute or a part of the virtue of temperance in that it enables self-mastery. The second aspect of looking at purity that John Paul II wants to talk about through Thessalonians is the notion, and he says this can be perceived as a more positive version or vision of purity, um, is this notion of keeping the body or appreciating the body with a disposition of holiness and reverence. So this is a perspective that recognizes the dignity of the body, its value as an image of God, and that it must be treated with great respect and reverence. 
And so if we jump on a second, this would be a more positive way of looking at the notion of purity. So he then goes on to abbreviate these two ways of examining purity. He says the first one, he abbreviates to one in inverted commas, abstaining, or um, in brackets, temperance. And the second way of looking at purity, he refers to as keeping, as in keeping uh, a holiness and reverence for the body. So it's abstaining and keeping. These are the two dimensions of purity. And he goes on to say that they are strictly connected and dependent upon one another. And so we might then ask the question, well, why is that the case? And he goes on to explain that you can't keep the body in holiness and reverence unless you abstain from unchastity. And it's only on being able to see and appreciate the value in the holiness and reverence of the body that you are motivated or inspired to a desire to be chaste and to turn away from unchastity. So the two dimensions of purity that he wants to focus on are deeply interconnected and codependent. So if the St. Paul, purity is not merely an ability or a skill, but it is, as John Paul II says, it is the concrete manifestation of life according to the spirit. And if you recall, last week I was quoting um, some of the, address, the addresses of Pope Benedict in his general audience, I think it was mm. 2006. He had four audiences focused on St. Paul. And just to recap on what he said, he said the spirit, capital S, in fact, is that interior power which harmonizes believers' hearts with Christ's heart and moves them to love brethren as Christ loved them. The spirit immerses us in the very rhythm of divine life, which is a life of love, and labeling us to share personally in the relations between the father and the son. So life according to the spirit is what enables us to harmonize our hearts with Christ, to love as he loves, to see as he sees and to nurture purity in all its dimensions and in all our actions. And then this audience comes to a conclusion as it segues from Thessalonians into 1 Corinthians. And this, of course, is St. Paul's ecclesial teaching, according to which the church is the body of Christ. And it's a passage that I'm sure we're all very familiar with. Um, but John Paul II says, not only is this very important from an ecclesial perspective, but it's also very important from a theology of the body perspective, and it has a great contribution to make. So I'll just close my section with this. John Paul II says, um, in quoting Corinthians, and I'll just quote Corinthians first, he says, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them he willed. The members of the body that seem weaker are more necessary. And those members of the body that we think less honourable, we clothe with greater reverence. And our unpresentable members are treated with greater modesty. Whereas our presentable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honour to the member that lacked it, so that there may be no disunion within the body, but the members may have care for one another. And so John Paul II concludes this audience by demonstrating through his analysis of, of Galatians, of Thessalonians, and now as we move into Corinthians, highlighting this essential message of the notion of a deep reverence and respect for the body. I'll hand over there to you now, Father. Thank you, Christine, um, for again, a wonderful summary um, and analysis of this um, tricky concept or a tricky series of concepts if you like aren't they from saint paul so as you've been saying uh christy moving into then audience 55 the same themes are outlined uh, by jp2 <clears throat> and if you like I want to begin at the end of this audience um, and just to, he, he, these are my own words in a sense, but he's backing up a little bit 
by saying that in this is audience here, yeah, 55 paragraph six. So the man of original innocence before the fall, male and female, about whom we read, both were naked and they did not feel shame, as we've mentioned many times, Genesis 2.25 did not feel that disunion within the body. And so, as we've been trying to, to describe and understand that the condition we're talking about here is historical man, and so we're in a fallen state. And so that's important that we keep reminding ourselves that what St. Paul is trying to do uh, through the teaching of Jesus, is to offer us the remedy out of this fallen state. And so that's really important and really hopeful. This is indeed the good news. And so they're moving into the final paragraph of audience 55. JP2 says, Nevertheless, in the same description in 1 Corinthians, Paul also indicates the way that leads precisely on the basis of the sense of shame to the transformation of this state, to the gradual victory over this disunion in the body, a victory that can and should be realized in the human heart. This is precisely the road of purity or of keeping the body with holiness and reverence. And so this is always to keep in mind, St. Paul is showing us the way that leads out of the sadness and the imprisonment of impurity. Uh, this reduction, reductionist vision that doesn't recognize the spousal meaning of the body, that doesn't uh, recognize the gift of the other. And so I guess just for my own contribution here, Christine, just to, to read a paragraph of Christopher West's commentary, because I think it really beautifully summarizes uh, this audience, these two audiences in many ways. So this is from page... 270 of Christopher West, the, the Theology of the Body Explained, a commentary on these audiences. So really st struck me as very powerful that the key to rediscovering purity is to recognize that there is imprinted on our experience of shame a certain echo of the original innocence of man, a photographic negative, as it were, the positive of which was precisely original innocence. This is commenting exactly on this audience 55, paragraph four. The negative, he says, provides a clue of the positive image. Similarly, the shame that leads us to consider our genitals the male and the female, less honourable and unpresentable is the negative. But shame's direct relation to our genitals provides a clue for understanding the true meaning and profound dignity of our creation as male and female. If we discover this negative or flip it over, we realize that these parts of our bodies, far from being less honorable, deserve all the greater honor. For these parts of our bodies distinguish the sexes and thus reveal our call to image God in a life-giving communion. And I just thought, Christine, wow, when I read that, it really became clear that Adam and Eve in the original state of innocence were naked without shame so they never um they never thought of using each other or just reducing the other to body parts and so it's hard for us to imagine that situation impossible really for us to experience that 
because we're in historical man. But as the um, Genesis 2 unfolds, they hid themselves and they covered the body parts that most revealed um, this call to, to, um, to life-giving communion. So they didn't put fig leaves on their elbows and kneecaps and ears. <laughs> and so what John Paul II is saying is that the echo of that, why do we cover our genitals? We feel most shame when they are revealed to someone else. And that is an indicator. And so the process of transformation is far from condemning those as shameful, but rather the recognition of their incredible importance in God's plan of salvation and this theology of the body. And so from a position of shame, almost covering them away, um, setting them aside, hiding them, we should reverence them most beautifully in the way we dress uh, as men and women through a recognition of their utmost dignity and importance. As I say, in the recognition that these are the very, um, not the very parts of the body, but yeah, in the sense, the very parts of the body that most reveal that life-giving gift of Holy Communion. And that is why in the historical situation, although we are fallen through the gift of the Holy Spirit um, and the gift of purity and reverence, we can, if you like, reestablish that beauty and dignity in a recognition of the supreme importance of everything of a woman's body that um, contributes to that communion and everything in a man's body that contributes to that communion. And so it's a wonderful journey, um, I think, uh, Christine, of transformation and hope and how our present fallen, pornified saturated culture needs to hear this message absolutely so that is my offering for audience 55 yeah well it's just struck me i've got a quote here i just made a, a note of this one from audience 45 and it just ties in with what you're saying father so uh, john paul ii says the man of original innocence male and female did not feel shame did not feel disunion within the body an analogous harmony in man's innermost being the harmony of the heart corresponded to the objective harmony that the creator gave to the human body. This purity of heart, which allowed them to experience the unitive power of their bodies and was the unsuspectable substratum of their personal union and communio personarum. So it's this notion that there was no shame, there was no rupture, um, but equally, not, not just in the, to the physical way that they looked upon one another, but within their hearts. They had this purity of heart that St. Paul is trying to instruct um, everyone on. And it's that purity of heart that enables this more perfected communion between the man and the woman. So I just thought that was a really nice quote to end on from audience 45. 55. Sorry, 55. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bye. Well, I agree, Christine, a beautiful, really beautiful, beautiful, yeah. deep uh, meditations on the dignity of the, the human body. Wow. Okay. Well, a shorter one today. Um, as we've said before, a lot of the um, audiences from John Paul II do circle around on very similar themes, although they, they each go a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper. So um, we're just making note of the fact that we've, pretty much exhausted that particular one and will continue as we go on to audience 56 and 57. Okay, so we'll leave it there for today, Father. Thank you. Thank you, Christine, and thanks to all our listeners. Please do like, subscribe and share. Get this message out to everyone, everyone in the, uh, the on the internet, which is everyone in the whole world, practically. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. Thanks, Father. God bless. God bless.